So, well, good morning. Um, I'm really glad to uh, introduce the keynote speaker for this morning, Rob Farber. So, I'm, I'm quite sure that most of you already know him. Um, he has an impressive uh, curriculum. And also, he's also author of um, uh, very popular books regarding CUDA and programming with um, Open ACC. So it's great. So I'll just uh, start. So Jordy told me that a number of you already know me, which uh, basically means no pressure of doing a good job on my presentation. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here with you. I have the great luck of being able to speak and teach around the world, uh, which is a wonderful thing. I'm one of the individuals who did basic research when I was in the theoretical division at Los Alamos on machine learning which established some of the technologies that are, you're actually using nowadays. And I saw the field grow and then implode in the uh, early 90s because so many people were jumping into the field who didn't understand the real capabilities of what the technology could do and they overpromised the technology. And it got to the point where the funding agencies and the investors said, ah, you've got machine learning in your proposal, don't, don't even talk to us. However, there's been a resurgence with the uh, deep learning and the ability to do vision recognition. And now machine learning is here to stay, uh, even though it's getting overpromised again and we're going to see the field implode again is my, is my uh, uh, projection. But what I'll be talking about is state of uh, the art machine learning algorithms and how they're affected by the near term technology trends. Many of you are interested in HPC. So this talk's going to be very relevant to you when I speak about the different hardware platforms that are coming out because we're seeing a technology arm race developing between the, uh, between the vendors. So what we're seeing is machine learning has redefined the market space. Ian Buck of NVIDIA, and we all know that NVIDIA is uh, very involved with getting into AI and um, becoming the leader in that area said that in the very near future, every piece of data in the data center is going to be touched by that, whether in enterprise or if you're also working in research. Uh, that's a very likely projection. Similarly, Intel, Diane Bryant, said uh, very specifically, by 2020, servers will run data analytics more than any other workload. And I'll start showing why this, this will be happening. But basically, that means that over the next three years, we're going to see a, uh, a real ramp up a real retooling of the technology because only 7% of the service in the data center right now are running machine learning workloads. And that's going to 100%. So it's going to affect all of us. So let's, let's take a look at a reason why machine learning and, uh, is so important. Well, first off, there's a famous XOR, exclusive OR problem. Prior to the ability to have these hidden neurons, hidden computational layers, Neural networks could only effectively fit a hyperplane, a flat plane to data. Now, with this XOR, it can fit bumpy surfaces. The reason why that's important is that now um, you can learn the exclusive OR problem, which means that the network, just from data, can wire itself up to solve any computational problem, any problem that we can solve ourselves or any other computable problem that, in theory at least, the neural network is a computationally universal machine, so there's nothing it can't learn is kind of the key point here, okay? So a beautiful example by a, a friend of mine, uh, Terry Sanowski, who did NetTalk um, back in the 1980s. Uh, and it's a beautiful way of actually doing scientific presentations so that people understand and get the concept easily. There's no mumbling about technology is he essentially trained up a network to read aloud, something that takes humans years to do. But he did it in, in a few minutes, and um, you can do it actually in less than a tenth of a second on uh, current machines. So what he did, these um, machine learning systems, you're doing an optimization problem. And so it's converging to a solution. So he stopped it about halfway through, at about 500 iterations. And here's what you get when you play um, some text. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that, that was a bit loud, but. <laughs> um, and I have one more uh, snippet if I could uh, play. Uh, and then when you run it to a final uh, solution, you get. I like to go to my grandmother's house. Well, because she gives us candy. So that's the 1986 version. 
And for those of us who know Espanol, <laughs> just done with my mobile phone. So that's the modern application of this technology. And actually at the international uh, school teaching sixth to 12th graders um, this technology, they immediately got it and I could play uh, various nice things, compliments to them in their own home languages. So you see the power of this computational universality. We applied it to predicting coding regions in DNA. So I'm just going to um, go through, and of course now we go through deep learning, which basically goes from an input layer to an output layer, and there's many hidden computational layers. And the reason for the word deep is uh, the researchers were trying to reflect that they were mimicking the many layers in the, uh, in the brain that for, say, visual processing. And of course, you're hearing about this better than human accuracy for uh, recognizing faces, a very human thing to do. Self-driving cars, a number of different, different areas. So a bellwether for that huge growth that I'm talking about is if you look at Google Trends, everybody is now using their mobile phones with speech recognition to say, where is the nearest uh, tapas place or the best tapas place here? And it's um, basically all these voice snippets that are being uh, processed in part on the mobile devices, but they're going to the data center and you've seen this growth. And when I was in Saudi Arabia, um, the CEO of uh, Saudi Telecom uh, was projecting with 5G, we're going to see a 1,000x increase in data uh, with the advent of 5G. Meanwhile, that growth is going to be continuing. What he indicates, this is not a typographical error, a $10 trillion incremental value. So there is a lot of money to be made in this market space. So by the way, I will do a little plug for Jordy because uh, he's a good guy. If you need to reconfigure your uh, HPC systems and uh, buy them, those are the guys you want to talk to because they're uh, familiar with this. We've had a few conversations. So anyways, remember that uh, NetTalk example now? What we did, and I'm going to take you through three or four different examples just showing how you can apply this to a number of different technologies. So what Terry did is he took an English uh, word, a, a snippet, and for the center letter uh, uh, had the network pronounce uh, the phoneme, the sound that would be made. And that's where we got NetTalk and the example that I gave you on my mobile phone. So, of course, we uh, are happy to mimic our friends, and so we uh, had the network learn to read aloud DNA to tell us where the uh, genes were, for example. That's a, some work that Alan Lapides and I did. And basically, it's the same trick, okay? Notice the pattern, and I'm gonna continue with this pattern so you can track this talk pretty well. So basically, we have some input that we are then going to a particular output that we want. So I've taken you now from speech to bioinformatics, so you can see how you can recognize and this is actually the work that I did uh, for my computational drug discovery company that we sold to a major pharma, is we wanted to predict binding affinity because that's how drugs work. They bind to inhibit an interaction or they bind to open a pathway to start an interaction, okay? So what we did is we had um, basically an antigen bind with an antibody and as you look at it, okay, you know, it's kind of complicated. Start looking at it a little more in detail and oh boy, that's getting really complicated. Um, I'm not starting to like this trend because uh, I don't really understand what's going on in that picture that well. And if you look at the electron microscope, uh, that doesn't mean anything to me. Maybe if it means something to you guys, you can help me out. So we uh, figured out a way to solve this problem and we went to investors, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and they came up with the question, which is how do we know that you're not playing expensive computer games with our money? And by the way, that's the question that you're going to get regardless if you're doing a machine learning application or if you're doing simulation, re remember what's going on on the computer is just a reflection of reality that we've put in there or that has been learned. So we had to answer that question. The way we did it is that we took um, the English text, which in this case was an amino acid chain with uh, five pro uh, six proteins. That gave us a 64 million large space that we had to search and we predicted the binding affinity, okay? If everything worked well, that should that should be great. So we went to our favorite wacky experimentalists and um, they said, well, you know, 64 million, dream on guys, because uh, we only have one or two uh, thousand examples that are highly biased. In other words, we've really sampled um, the areas that we were interested in, but we know nothing, uh, we don't have samples anywhere else outside of that. So we said, well, it's the data we've got, let's work with it. But notice we're doing very small sampling of the surface. 
And that's one of the points uh, for machine learning is that we can take sparse data and actually learn very useful things. So we did the net talk example is we learned essentially a function that uh, a model that we give the, uh, our representation of the hexamer and predict the binding affinity. Making sense so far to everybody? So then what we were able to do is run that on our computer as a uh, simulator for hill climbing. We wanted to find the peak here and so we just started by changing the uh, last position and kept the highest value. So then we moved to the next step where we change the second position and keep going through that hole until we find uh, a high value. And in this case, we predicted a six order magnitude higher binding affinity and we gave it to the experimentalists who made it and they came back and they said, yes, we've confirmed that. So there are a couple points that uh, the computer uh, appears to correctly predict our data and we were able to uh, essentially take a very small set of the data uh, of the big space that we we're sampling. So the uh, investors believed us, they gave us money and we did wonderful things and actually made a company that we were able to sell. So using that same kind of example, let's say if you're a trader um, or if you want to do um, audio signal processing or something, what we can do is we can, instead of English text, we give it the data at time t, time t minus some delta, two delta, and so on, and we predict some uh, delta into the future, okay? So it's just a waveform, and it just learns that. Well, it works beautifully. Here's our, uh, again, our little equation with the deltas and predicting the time in the future. Then what we do is we take that prediction, put it in here, and run for time two, and we just keep iterating going out in the future. And so say if we're predicting the price of gold, well, guess what, guys? It works great. Here's the, um, the error as we go out in time, and we were working orders of magnitude better than the best known methods, okay? So are you starting to see some of the value behind this? I mean, there's other tricks that we can play, so we can do the sliding training uh, during, uh, during the uh, training process. And if you have vibrating systems, you can uh, do bifurcation analysis. So if you're working with people who uh, manufacture engines or uh, automobiles. So it's widely applicable far beyond what you're hearing about this deep learning. So one of the uh, cool things, how many of you know what the uh, cursive dimensionality is? Any hands? I saw, I saw a couple of hands. So one of the problems as you do a search in your database on high dimensional data, if you're searching just a 2D region, as I'm showing with my hands with a circle, it's a fairly small volume. If I go to a sphere, it grows exponentially because I've got that ex uh, extra dimension, so it's a lot bigger. And people get amused when I try and indicate what happens with a hypersphere, especially when we go to a thousand dimensions. The problem is with the cursive dimensionality, when you do your database search on that, you either get no data or you get all the data because in high dimensions, everything is the nearest neighbor. So what we do is we take our, say, thousand dimensional input data, run it through one of these networks that has a bottleneck, so it has to come up with an encoding that represents that low dimension. And we just reflect at the output what the input is, train it up, and guess what? We can use that to then generate, say, XYZ coordinates, and we can look at the surface. So we've introduced a concept of similarity, and we can do wonderful things with our searches. So both commercially and uh, scientifically. The point here is that we use any numerical method to solve this. And basically, all we're doing is a numerical optimization. Again, we're not doing learning, we're not doing AI, we're just doing a numerical optimization where we broadcast the examples, and that's the fastest way to get data to a lot of computers. Uh, think of a television uh, program. It takes just as much time to broadcast to one television set as it does to a billion television sets. Similarly, what we do is we have a strong scaling calculation of the partial errors, and then we have a um, log step where we um, essentially compute one number which goes back in and we just keep iterating until we get a good solution. In other words, we move from the babbling phase to actually being able to read aloud. Make sense? Okay, so here's some scaling results, very important uh, on Intel Xeon Phi, 2.2 petaflops average sustained performance uh, using uh, 16,384 GPUs, 13 petaflops average sustained performance. And we can go as big as we want. Uh, basically, you see the scaling, it's a straight line. So we, uh, we can go in, this is an exascale capable problem. So however big a machine we build, we can learn that much faster. Isn't this great? So now, 
we're back to the market is that it's up to the machines now. It's purely, once you actually get the data, it's purely up to the hardware for how fast you can learn, how brilliant your neural network is. And so we're going from 7% to 100% in roughly three years. So there's four camps, and this is where it becomes interesting for those of you doing procurements, because not only are you going to be doing machine learning workloads, you're also going to be doing many other uh, different kinds of computational workloads. So there's the CPUs with, of course, the various vendor logos, GPUs with some famous logos in there, and then there's field programmable gate arrays, a kind of a custom solution, and you can actually get to custom chips as well. People are competing in all the different areas um, in these. So there's roughly four camps. So let's kind of cut through the marketing fluff. So deep learning originated as a technical term, just talking about mimicking the brain, as I pointed out before, with all these intervening layers. And um, it's morphed into a marketing term that people are trying to use to sell you hardware, okay? And now it's getting even worse because it's morphed into AI. And if you think about all the preconceptions we have about AI and um, uh, what the potential is for a machine that actually can think, we're not doing thinking, we're just doing numerical optimization. It's, that's all it is, it's math. It's not AI, it's, uh, it's just numerical optimization of a set of model parameters to minimize a cost function. There's no concept of reality, and there's no concept of a set of goals. There's no thought or thinking going on behind there. So as far as the uh, software and the hardware concer is concerned, parallelism is what speeds the training, the learning process. And that uses something called a SIMD model, single instruction, multiple data, which maps perfectly to processors, vector processors, GPUs, FPGAs. So when someone's trying to tell you a solution that's um, ideal for machine learning or deep learning, Sorry guys, it maps perfectly to any and all uh, platforms, okay? So just like all of our HPC workloads, training is memory bound. So as long as you have enough computational oomph to actually keep the memory subsystem saturated, it doesn't matter how much additional compute you've got in there. So that's why a CPU can actually outperform a GPU even though the relative performances are big in terms of the peak rate. So it's more limited by the cache and the memory subsystems rather than flops. And then uh, GPUs and massively parallel devices also have a challenge that you have to be able to use all the device parallelism, otherwise your performance is wasted. So basically what I'm finding now is modern GPUs are so fast that if you're working with hundreds to tens of thousands of training examples, the CPU is gonna be faster because you're only using a fraction of the GPU performance. GPUs go wide, you have to use lots of different threads. Don't get me wrong, I love GPUs. So the point of all of this is it's very lucrative, very um, important math that we're doing, but it's not learning. And I just kind of give an example, is back in the 1990s, we used an artificial neural network, a neural network, um, uh, we didn't, uh, some colleagues we did at Sandia, to recognize a tank versus a car. And they trained up, and just like with NetTalk, they got a low error, so they assumed that they were in the reading aloud phase, not babbling, okay? Well, they took it out, and performance in the field was abysmal. And since they spent a lot of money on this project, the funding agency said, go in and fix it, figure out what's going on. Turns out that most of the pictures were taken of the tank on cloudy days, and most of the pictures of the cars were taken on a sunny day. This thing doesn't have a concept of reality. It doesn't have a concept of goals. So the network solved that math problem by essentially distinguishing cloudy versus uh, sunny days, which is really bad news if you're driving in a sunny day and they shoot that missile off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've talked about training, which is, of course, the big computational problem with neural networks. But people also talk about inferencing. And remember that $10 trillion incremental value? That's gonna be realized through the inferencing operation. And inferencing is sequential. We're all uh, physicists or computer scientists in here, so I don't need to really point out the, um, the distinction there, I hope. Uh, if, if you don't understand it, talk to me afterwards. So a single um, uh, inference operation, there is a limited amount of parallelism, I'll, I'll say that, but think of it just as a purely sequential operation. And so inferencing, by the way, is memory bound. It's limited by the cache and the memory subsystems. Are we seeing a pattern? I hope so. 
Um, so uh, just from some examples, here's a uh, 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 reading aloud text example from a paper 2017 showing that it's memory, memory limited. So in short, most people and most of your researchers that are running on your clusters that you're building uh, are not going to need inferencing optimized as devices because that only happens when you need to do bulk inferencing in the data center. Uh, individual inferencing operation is dominated by the sequential performance, which is why most uh, sequencing is done on, uh, most inferencing is done on Intel Xeon processors. And there's also a load balancing problem, and I hope I don't have to explain that here, but some of your speech uh, segments are coming in are short, and some of them are really long, like when I try and dictate a text or something to say to someone and translate it to Spanish. So that means with that load balancing problem, that even though your GPU can do thousands of threads concurrently, it all boils down to being dominated by the longest runtime thread, and so you don't actually get to make a lot of use of that uh, lovely parallelism. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the, an overview of the performance limitations of machine learning in the, in the future, and I hope you see the value. Have to talk about one kind of mathematical thing that's really important, and that is the calculation of a gradient. The physicists here are gonna understand that right off the bat. Basically, this is a black box function that is called by that, um, uh, by that learning mechanism. And there's a, a, like the uh, BFGS uh, method or conjugate gradient. That can give you orders of magnitude faster performance. So if you're looking at, say, reduced precision to give you a 2x performance speed up, if you use gradient-based methods, you can get a 10 or 100,000 times faster convergence to the solution, moving from that babbling phase that I uh, showed you to actually being able to read aloud. So um, basically, people use uh, a number of different software packages. I highlight Piano. It can symbolically calculate the gradient. It's trivially easy. It really is easy to see. You don't have to understand the math. You just have to understand calling this one function. It then generates native code for speed, and uh, you're good to go, right? Well, no, because the gradient gets very large. So if you've got 10 parameters, the gradient can actually grow by a factor of 100. If you've got 1,000 parameters, the gradient can grow in size by effectively uh, a million times. So people are also doing uh, um, computations with hundreds of thousands of parameters. So what that means is, boy, do you become memory and cache bound or potentially atomic operation limited. So you can't get high parallelism out of that, okay? Also, you have to be aware that uh, the code can simply be too big for um, accelerated types of devices such as GPUs that have a limited amount of instruction memory. So there are tricks to get around these problems and GPUs are using them and there's some very smart people using that, but effectively that introduces communications overhead. You have to transfer data back and forth and it becomes a lot more complicated. And we all know that the PCI bus is famous for being limited. So succinctly, real memory for real performance. So um, we're moving into the era of big memory. The nice thing is, is that we can get workstations now with terabytes of memory, and I'm gonna show you some results in a minute using tens of terabytes of physical memory. Okay, so hopefully that all made sense. The other is when your uh, machine learning people come in, unless they're doing deep learning for uh, face recognition, most data scientists are going to basically use one or two hidden layers. Okay, there's a reason for that is something called the vanishing gradient problem, which is pretty simple, is if you take your deeper network going from input through your computational layers and output. So the um, black box optimization tries to have the first layer, since you're using something called the chain rule, tries to uh, correct as much of the error as it can. So that means that the second layer only gets the remaining gradient. So you put all the work in here, this picks up what it can, and this lower layers can learn hundreds of times slower than the upper layers. So there's really no benefit for going to deeper layers unless you use very specialized types of uh, activation functions that allow the gradient to pass through and bypass this um, vanishing gradient problem. We've also heard lots of marketing fluff about reduced precision and specialized hardware. And so instead of 32-bit, if you run with 16-bit math, yeah, you can double the number of training iterations per time because you can do twice the number of operations and your memory subsystem is twice as efficient. And guess what, guys? If you go from, uh, to 8-bit math, 
everything is quadrupled. And it makes sense from a biology standpoint, because I don't know about you, but this is not a high numerical computational environment, especially with jet lag. <laughs> so, um, so from the biology point of view, it makes sense. But um, uh, it doesn't make sense from a machine learning aspect. Because remember how we went through that babbling phase? There's something called convergence. And even though you get, may get like a four times speed up, it may take 400 times longer to find the solution. So you actually lose. Um, it could take 100 times longer. Um, so NVIDIA introduced some, some of these things, like in the Volta, you heard about the tensor core. How many of you remember the MMX instruction set that came out in the Pentium era? Any hands? Good, people are awake out there, yay. So remember how that was all marketed to you? And this is great, it's the best thing since sliced bread. It only worked for a few media applications. Aside from that, completely useless, okay? Uh, we're seeing the same thing with the marketing guys because basically the tensor core is very useful for certain types, a subset of a subset of a subset of machine learning, just like those MMX instructions for multimedia. So basically, in my opinion, and yeah, we can have some rather long and preferably over beer uh, uh, heated uh, <laughs> technical discussions, but basically, it causes slow convergence, or even worse, um, and I can go into an explanation of it, but I'll do it later, because I'm running a little short on time. Even worse, you can get it stuck in that local minima, so that you train up and you're in that babbling phase still, or you're in the case where you're uh, telling your customer that you're gonna blow up the tanks, but not the cars, and <clears throat> oopsie. So, uh, basically, I recommend avoiding a reduced precision at this time, unless you really know what you're doing. Okay. So. Let's take a look at the computational frameworks that, that are used for doing this processing. So NVIDIA uh, with the GPUs restarted massive parallelism with CUDA and GPU computing. I've made a lot of money teaching people doing CUDA and um, doing things, and it's made big inroads into the data center. So that's what uh, trying to capitalize on that 10 trillion market. Uh, the big thing, and I'm just gonna talk about one key aspect, is GPU threads are grouped into thread blocks. So we basically have a bunch of threads in what's considered a thread block. Anybody who plays cards, think of this as a card in a deck of um, playing cards. So only threads on the card can talk to each other. They can't talk to any threads on any other cards. So that means that uh, once I get all the data dependencies resolved for one of my cards, then I can toss that off to something called an active queue. And I build up this active queue and I have my GPU uh, rating, waiting for work and basically it goes in and Whenever there's hardware ready, it just runs, and that's how you get the load balancing across this uh, massively parallel computer. It's wonderful. It's a beautiful simplification. I think it's one of the most significant simplifications in parallel computing in the last, in the last two decades. The nice thing is executables can run unchanged on a bigger GPU. So your users build an executable. You buy a new, bigger GPU, you plug it in. They actually can start running with those extra many thousands of, of threads. Now there might be some special instructions that you want to use, in which case you want to re uh, recompile, but as far as exploiting the parallelism, you don't even have to recompile. It's a beautiful simplification. So here's that dealer analogy, is I'm, if I'm the scheduler and I've got one of the processing units, I just throw out a card every time he raises his hand and says I'm ready for work. If I've got three of them, okay, away we go. And if I can go fast enough, I can just shoot cards out on a uh, many thousand uh, GPU anytime anyone raises their hand. That's why it all works. Beautiful simplification. So that's why NVIDIA is claiming big performance increases uh, since 2013, 65X and 40X. As long as you've got the parallelism, you bet GPUs are wonderful. And uh, uh, be careful of this double, single, and half precision stuff that's going on. I hope I've pointed out to you that for machine learning, you really wanna pay attention to single precision performance because you, you do the summation in double precision to make uh, best use. And most of your HPC workloads uh, work in, in double precision. Don't buy into the marketing fluff on 16-bit. Uh, and I can go into the reason for, on that for why, but people at the Magma Group are seeing that it's not ready for prime time for HPC yet. So remember that $10 trillion in hockey puck growth? So we're seeing marketing like this. It says that uh, you can solve um, the uh, where is the nearest Szechuan restaurant in six milliseconds. Well, that's for a single thread, and then, of course, you think, well, I've got zillions of speech requests coming in or other inferencing requests coming in. Remember those load balancing issues? 
um, there's results showing that CPUs are now doing faster than uh, real time for the speech recognition and others. So dig deeper. Um, Processor-based computing. Uh, basically, we've got the IBM solutions. We've got the Intel Xeon processor roadmap. AMD has something. Uh, the big thing with IBM is that they've got NVIDIA, NVLink and CAPI. These are high uh, performance computing mechan uh, communications mechanisms to move data between the host processor and the GPU. And um, uh, we're also seeing with the Xeon and Xeon Phi. Xeon Phi is, is wonderful. Um, for floating point operations. It's got dual AVX 512 vector units, so you can get a lot of vector capability really fast. What people hate about Intel Xeon Phi is the co an individual core is one third the performance of a Xeon Phi, of a Xeon processor. So that's why most procurements right now are waiting for a Xeon Skylake, because they can avoid the pain of educating their users how to reparallelize their code. If you do have to, NERSC has something called a roofline model, and it's part of the Intel Advisor. Fantastic tool for helping you optimize. NERSC spent two and a half years trying to figure out how to communicate to a user base of 5,000 different projects on how to start getting people to move to Intel Xeon Phi. It's a wonderful tool for any kind of optim uh, performance optimization. I highly recommend it. But just think roofline model. The other is there's um, uh, unpackaged photonics for Intel Omnipath. And same thing um, with, uh, with Intel Skylake. The reason is, is that as you go to EDR um, network connectivity, a single cable can cost $1,200 US denomination. Very expensive. Um, so the way, um, uh, and the network cost itself for your cluster can be 30 to 40% of the cluster cost. That's money that's not being put into making good use for your users of the flops and the memory bandwidth that they actually need to solve their problems. So I'm very happy about the on-chip, on-package, I should say, uh, photonics for Intel Omnipath. Kind of puts uh, companies like Mellanox in the situation. How many of you remember the old days where you used to buy a USB uh, thing that had a Wi-Fi on it to, uh, to Wi-Fi enable your computer? Then Intel came out with Wi-Fi on the Celeron chip, and all those companies went out of business. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Mellanox is going to do because they're now in the situation of being those U in those USB Wi-Fi vending um, uh, position, and we're seeing a fast um, jump in um, in Omnipath adoption. Um, also, Skylake has good cache, but it's the fastest sequential performance, and it has AVX 512. The other is is that you can have up to eight sockets with um, uh, with Skylake. Remember how I was jumping up and down about the uh, memory performance? There's an extra memory bandwidth um, on the Skylake processors as well. Uh, then for using future work, um, there's also a, a uh, plug-in, uh, the ability to plug in FPGAs and ASICs, custom solutions, into some Skylake SKUs. So that's very interesting. And then big memory. And in fact, you want to look at something called 3D Crosspoint. And I'll make that point in greater detail in just a moment. So that's why I'm seeing many procurements delaying. Yes, question. Does the switch allow us to offline because it used to be NVDA in the past? Uh, one more time. What you mentioned about Mellanox and the situation is in the BDA future. Does that apply to the NVDA situation? Is this in terms of real time? Do we are seeing similar combinations in the long run? Um, I no, I don't think it's I don't think it's similar in that we're not seeing a one-to-one -one replacement. So, and, and a huge uh, drop in price and uh, a drop in latency, like what you see with having the on-package um, Omnipath. So it's not a direct competition. NVIDIA is doing a beautiful job staging themselves, and they're leveraging the uh, procurement dollars. I'll talk to you about that uh, offline. But basically, I phrase Volta as a, an incredible future gaming GPU and cinematic GPU for virtual reality um, uh, wrapped in the guise of a uh, computational GPU for uh, machine learning. Because NVIDIA is very shrewd at uh, maintaining and preserving their, their core markets. So I'm not seeing uh, accelerators getting replaced with, with uh, one caveat uh, that we'll get to in a minute for machine learning, and that is, is that the ASICs, um, uh, uh, let me get to that slide. Okay. So, uh, processors use a traditional vector ISA. So what happens is that you have processing cores, and we have a text. Uh, 
and what happens is the core issues the uh, appropriate instructions to the vector units and you load a vector pipeline and guess what you get um, a fair degree of instruction parallelism and a nice speed up okay and uh, then what you have to do is you've got you have to make use of both all the cores as you go from no parallelism to using all the cores on your processor meanwhile also making use of the vector capability and if you don't use the vectorization, you can actually hurt your performance with AVX 512 by, by almost an order of magnitude. So where you get the highest performance is where you make use of the vector parallelism. And that's also where the NERSC roofline model is so important. Um, also, by the way, a uh, little plug for my book, because if you program an OpenACC uh, as opposed to OpenMP, you can run on GPUs and CPUs. We'll see OpenMP4 coming up, and of course when I mentioned that I've got the open MP4 book coming up and I'll tell you about that one too. <laughs> so what we're seeing now between the platforms is a convergence and this is for machine learning training but it's also for all your HPC application workloads as well. So NVIDIA has a working MMU, a memory management unit and uh, Xeon Phi also known as Knight's Landing has moved from a coprocessor to an SMP kind of an environment. So what that means is that data can automatically be moved between the CPU and the GPU on an on-demand basis. It's basically like virtual memory. Well, guess what? On Xeon Phi, data can be automatically moved between the uh, near stacked memory, which gives you about three to five X the memory bandwidth performance, and all HPC applications are memory bandwidth performance if they're written reasonably well, um, and the far memory. So basically, we're getting demand paging between memory hierarchies. That's how you can view it. That means that offload programming is, quote, no longer a requirement, it's an optimization. Okay, that's beautiful because it simplifies our development. There's caveats to all of this. Um, but this was a real uh, deal breaker for GPUs because that was a barrier to GPU adoption. Um, so yeah, NVIDIA is moving in the right direction. Um, stack memory is much faster, much more uh, uh, capa uh, capacity and energy efficient. So IBM is uh, kind of a little different in that they have the NV link so that they can speed up this automatic movement between the CPU and the GPU. And um, offload programming is no longer a requirement. Um, by the way, the Pascal GPUs, my animation's a little off, they have the stacked memory as well, but in limited capacity. So that means that stacked memory and the NV link should be you know, at the highest performance uh, solution. In practice, I'm not seeing, um, your, your benchmarking may vary. Uh, I'm still seeing very, very good performance of the PCI-based, um, uh, like the super microsystems using the P100s compared to the uh, NVLink. So the N uh, IBM approach is we're going to use accelerators, and uh, then they've got something called Watson and True North. The key point is that uh, power is key to the, um, uh, the profitability of a data center. So basically on this True North chip, I'll talk about it in just a minute, but you can have essentially the neuronal capacity of a B brain, and it consumes about 70 milliwatts. <laughs> That's not a typo. Okay, so we're seeing some future move, uh, some benefits in the future for uh, inferencing. So the Open uh, uh, Power Special Sauce has this CAPI interface, the Coherent Accelerator Processor interface, and then in VLink, um, it makes everything easier. The reason why I like it so much is that just like Skylake. It can support special uh, accelerators like FPGAs or the, uh, the machine learning hardware. Uh, shares a virtual memory, and here's kind of a schematic. Um, but one of the things that nobody really tells you in all the marketing literature is the data handling can take as much time as a computational problem. And in fact, that's where most people spend their time <laughs> rather than training. That consumes roughly 80% of the data scientist's time. So, if you look on that 13 petaflop run that I told you about on Oak Ridge Titan, I have 112 terabytes of uh, GPU only memory capacity. So how do I process that data to get 112 terabytes? And so that's where the IBM CAPI interface came in. Um, uh, they have a, a 60 terabyte flash storage subsystem that they essentially through the CAPI interface made it look like made memory. So you're running with a 60 plus terabyte main memory computer. Yes, the performance uh, characteristics are different, granted. But SPEC is a, a financial benchmark and um, they ran their M3 benchmark on it and they said that they had the fastest observed um, uh, results ever that they've seen. 
some of the results were 212 times faster. So for data handling and database operations in the data center, the CAPI interface is, um, has some real significant advantages. Remember how in the previous slide I mentioned 3D Crosspoint and the direct access to Skylake? You're going to have Intel DIMMs that will plug in so you'll be able to do the same thing with a memory technology that is purported to be three to five times faster than Flash. And I've been seeing the results, benchmark results backing that up. But more than that, they don't even have the, uh, um, the uh, delay of going across the, the CAPI uh, interface. Instead, it's just direct memory access through the memory subsystem. So that's something exciting to look at. Um, then we have parallel file systems because once you process the data, you've got to load it in. Um, and basically, I have an MPI client, and uh, it makes full use of Lustre, GPFs, um, BGFS, whatever. And so you can do streaming in. Uh, Lustre and GPFS both can deliver a terabyte of data per second in streaming mode. So that 112 terabyte memory subsystem takes a very small amount of my runtime allocation because it, uh, it only takes you know, uh, less than two minutes to load my entire data set from scratch if I had everything into the GPUs. So we're there. Other training and inference solutions, and this is um, a little less applicable to the HPC crowd. Uh, there's FPGAs. They're already used in production. They're very, very fast and power efficient. You can use them via CAPI or the Skylake interface. They're very difficult to program, and I, yeah, I have time for this. The way I describe programming in FPGA is with a general purpose uh, computer, when something breaks, there are people in the hallways yelling and screaming. When an FPGA project, when something works, there are people in the hallways yelling and screaming. <laughs> so they're very difficult. Then we have these custom chips um, for machine learning. These are dedicated. But you can see just from the heat sinks that um, we're moving, uh, say, from the, the NVIDIA to the Facebook systems to the IBM to the Google TPU. You can see how much power is being dissipated. Here's a Google TPU. It looks like a skyscraper for the heat, heat sink. Okay. But what happens is for uh, Google TPU, they're 15 to 30x faster than both CPUs and GPUs for training. So it's very possible that this technology is going to leapfrog both NVIDIA, that has a huge investment in saying we're the AI company, um, as well as CPUs. And the big thing for the data center is that they're seeing an 80, uh, 30 to 80 uh, percent improvement in uh, essentially uh, the transaction power per watt. Uh, TPU2 is exclusive to Google Cloud. Uh, an Intel-owned uh, company, Nirvana, is coming out with, uh, with a version that you can actually um, buy and have sitting next to your system. So uh, it could be that this whole debate about CPU versus GPU for machine learning just gets completely destroyed uh, by the custom systems, and that's coming up very quickly. Looking towards the future, just because um, uh, I think it's so exciting, is there was an argument, there's a different approach um, to machine learning, which is using a model more appropriate to the, the human brain. And actually, a couple days ago, I gave this talk at the uh, Blue Brain Project um, in Geneva that are actually studying biological brains. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, uh, but basically, with neural networks, we made one simplification. Is we have this neuron that basically, if, if the input becomes too low, it saturates to zero. And if it becomes too high, it just saturates to one. It doesn't grow infinitely because um, I don't, my brain and it can't handle infinite uh, voltage. <laughs> so I don't know about yours. Um, so they're using something called an integrate and fire spiking neuron. The thing is, is that with this Proceedings of National Academy paper, they showed that they could compete with the best known state-of-the-art algorithms for image recognition but they were um, using between 25 and 275 milliwatts of power to use this, not even a watt. I mean, this are, these are thousands of um, uh, milliwatts, excuse me. So they're getting effectively 6,000 frames per second per watt, which is so far beyond what the current technology can do. It gives us hope that we, uh, we may actually get to an AI phase eventually. So you can go really big. Uh, remember I mentioned the B brain on a chip? Here's a rat brain on a desk, same capacity. So what we're seeing is a growth uh, in the future that is extraordinary. Here's the PNAS results just showing that it's real. Um, you can get these slides so you can look through, and I've got links to everything, and I'm available for uh, questions and, of course, consulting. <laughs> um, so some of the common software packages, um, pretty much 80 to 90% of your users are going to be using Theano, TensorFlow, Torch, or Cafe. That's what almost every, da uh, every data researcher uses. Intel competes with their data analytics library. 
it's a wonderful solution because it actually does the data management for you, so it'll do the right um, mapping to the memory subsystem so you get the most efficiency. Similarly with the NVIDIA's uh, CUDNN, their machine learning library. Uh, just kind of getting towards the end, I uh, mentioned that fast and scalable work. We, uh, we have people in here who are researching and doing a lot of uh, wonderful work with, with workflows uh, back there, Rosa. And um, so she's, she's a person to talk with. This is a framework that I created. I've been using it since the 80s. Uh, I was the youngest person in the room uh, when I created it. Now I'm getting to be one of the older people in the room, so it happens. Um, so basically, you can go from a, uh, um, I have tutorials online on how to use this. But basically, you go from a persistent store through whatever kinds of hardware you want to a persistent store. And uh, so then just packets can go out all over the place and you can really confuse yourself where data is flowing. But it's really available um, and, it's, uh, and it scales for collaborations as well. Uh, the nice point is, is that I'm still using data sets from the 1980s for validation and verification of uh, codes <clears throat> that are now delivering petaflops of performance. So that's very important to have that kind of longevity in your workflows. <clears throat> so you get the points so I can get past this uh, load balancing. And um, so I kind of went through this uh, so that uh, you, there were the desire for lots and lots of questions. Uh, I hope there are. You've been really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dead silence. Either I put you to sleep or I baffled you with my BS. <laughs> Come on, guys. Uh, you went quickly uh, between uh, training and inference. Uh, and uh, what type of, uh, and you just said from inference it was sequentially, uh, <laughs> it was a sequential process. But from a, I would say, um, precision perspective, are they, is the inference different of the training? Is, is the what a part of the training? From, from a precision, you talked about half precision ah. and so on and so forth. Okay. Is inference different? So as far as, um, so the question basically boiled down to is, is reduced precision important for inferencing if it's not necessarily useful for training? And the answer is yes, maybe. <laughs> okay. So I had a conversation with the chief scientist at Baidu uh, at GTC when he gave his, presented his results. And basically what uh, the companies are doing, like with um, NVIDIA, those P40 and P4 results that I flashed up on the screen, um, what they do is they train in the higher precision and then they drop down to use the lower precision for the inferencing. 4x speed up is, is a big deal in the data center because that means a quarter of the hardware that you need to have. And yes, what you can do is you convert the parameters basically from the floating point representation to the reduced precision representation. And that works well in practice for certain types of problems. Um, uh, for example, classification where we were saying, is this a coding region for DNA where the gene is, or no, there's not? Or for doing like the, uh, the speech to text, is you want to say essentially what, what are the, um, the category that this, this um, speech goes into that then they turn actually into the real speech. And so the chief scientist at Baidu said, it works really well for some problems, like the classifiers, but you tend to throw out outliers, okay? So that means it, that's not a big problem when you're doing speech recognition, especially in noisy environments, because you want to throw out outliers and things like that. It can be a real problem if you're programming for a, uh, say, self-driving car, and that outlier happened to be a kid running out into the street. So you need to be very careful. Uh, yes, that's a dramatic example. Um, the other is um, when I was benchmarking the P100s for reduced precision performance, and I was seeing it there, um, if you remember, you can predict time series data and do system models so that you can actually, on the computer, model what's going on inside the physical system, like a turbine or something like that, <clears throat> and try and, uh, and account for vibrations and things of that nature. Pardon me. <clears throat> Reduced precision is not going to necessarily work with that. And let me give you just a, a brief kind of a, a rough example. Uh, a highly sophisticated prop. So. In our paper that I referenced up there, and it's also easy to remember, is how neural networks work. Basically, what Alan Lapides and I showed, that the network is fitting a multidimensional surface. Okay, remember how I was talking how important the XR was, is that it could put bumps in the right place. So 
as you go, any, any, basically any of your uh, machine learning uh, uh, applications, you're, you're essentially mapping this, this more and more, ever more complicated, more bumpy surface, which makes the learning process a big data process problem because for everywhere there's a point of inflection on the surface that's important, what you need to do is you have to have some data there representing that bump. And so as you're getting to more complicated problems, that means you have to have more data uh, to re represent all those bumps so that the, that the neural network can fit the bumps in the right place. Am I making sense? Um, then if you follow that, what happens when you use a reduced precision, this is not 100% accurate, but it's close enough. How many of you have you seen Minecraft, the, the uh, virtual world built out of blocks? That's effectively what you're doing is you're you're coarse graining, you're discretizing that surface so that it becomes uh, basically uh, either 100% flat or there's this big discontinuity, this big jump. Well, all of the um, optimization algorithms um, assume that you have some idea of a gradient of a smoothly changing area so that you can, you can walk around. So what happens then is if I fall onto this table where it's flat, I can't look out in infinitely to see where to go. So I may just have to stay around in this one local region, which is entirely 100% flat. There's no numerical difference on where I can go. And basically, either the algorithm has to start making random uh, movements, which is going to slow your convergence, or it's going to say, I'm done, in which case your network is stuck in the babbling phase. So that's why um, the reduced precision, at least from a very 10,000-foot uh, point of view, is really lousy for, um, uh, for training. However, for inference, what happens is that you have this surface, and then you can either interpolate. You go onto the surface, uh, basically, from the known data. And essentially, you interpolate between the known data points to get to your exact right solution. And that tends to be very highly accurate. That's why we were able to do that non-linear system modeling and prediction with very high accuracy and get better results than the best known methods. And so if you're doing a classifier, it really doesn't matter if you're interpolating on that really flat surface. You're still going to get the same category, the same, yes, it's a cat, or yes, it's a dog, or whatever your, your categorization happens to be. Similarly, networks also work by extrapolation, which means I can take the data points I have and I can move to something I haven't seen before, say when we did the computational drug discovery. Okay, well, again, um, if you make this Minecraft kind of landscape, if it's flat, I don't care if I, I can extrapolate out as far as you want. I mean, you know, flat surface is real easy. It's just give me a ruler and away I go. I'm going to do as good as and faster probably than the fastest supercomputer in the world. So that's why it works, tends to work well for inferencing, which is uh, one of the reasons why you can do big data volume uh, processing at the reduced precision in the data center. That's why reduced precision is so important. So I answered your question probably more detail than you wanted <laughs> as he cowers under this flood of information that I'm giving him <laughs> and everyone else. But, but you get the point, I hope, for where the problem, where reduced precision is good, it has a place, and where hopefully you get a, a sense for where it's bad uh, and where it doesn't have its place. Oh, come on, more questions, please. <laughs> so for... Um uh, memory bound uh, word loops, um, if you would want to advise something quite quickly and with an existing uh, technology, uh, offer, well, usually uh, vendors offer you um, something like um, um, SSD memory dims. So it's written with a Flash Gordon um, kind of a system or Flash Lite. Um, so I was wondering if you had some exposure on similar kind of uh, environments? So, well, yes, I've had exposure in, in different ways. I, uh, I haven't been benchmarking the, uh, um, the particular devices that you were talking about, which is one of your value adds and why customers want to come talk to you. But um, as far as the bigger memory, um, I am seeing um, uh, a real value proposition coming through, especially for things like, um, like ray tracing. And basically, it boils down to we're getting into bigger and bigger memory, so we can do in core what we has to what we used to have to do out on on SSDs, uh, which are called out of core. So where we're getting this 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 revolution that's happening is that believe it or not, um, uh, I can show you some results where 
a single three terabyte um, uh, Xeon system, not Xeon Phi, Xeon system, can actually render in real time faster uh, a big cosmology, cosmology data set faster than a 200 GPU cluster just because of the memory limitations of the GPUs and there's, and there's uh, data communications back and forth. That's not to say that GPUs aren't also competing and, and coming up now with, with new results, but the point is, is that people are able to exploit the bigger memory to do log runtime based algorithms rather than hitting the problem with, uh, uh, with massive parallelism. So I'll step back to the other uh, converse, and um, th another question I'll get to you in just one sec, is that um, uh, NVIDIA showed at the, at the last keynote, uh, since we're talking about ray tracing, and the, the Blue Brain project was very interested in this. So all of you in HPC, we know that visualization, it, it kind of hits the marketing that we need to do. You come up with pretty pictures, you get the ideas across to the mass audience, which helps get your funding. So what Jensen showed at G, at, um, uh, for GPUs is they used machine learning so that they could take a, a basically a very coarse grained, a coarse rendered um, ray tracing image. Uh, it depends on the number of light rays that you pass through, so they just pass a very small number through. They could do that fairly quickly. And then they use this machine learning, this trained inferencing uh, black box to run through the picture, and it made it look as good as a real high fidelity um, uh, ray traced image. So what we're seeing is a competition heating up between hitting it with hardware with mass parallelism versus log runtime algorithms. And that's, uh, so it's the in-core versus out-of-core debate. And um, the basically, I think we're going to see fat nodes that uh, are measured in terabytes or tens of terabytes coming down the road very, very soon. And of course, it's going to be complicated because the different, because you're going to get different performance from the different mem different hierarchies in the memory subsystem. So it's going to become a little more complicated to categorize. But we, we are seeing a revolution, and your algorithms uh, all over from public source to, uh, to like the open source Osprey are going to start exploiting that. So that's something to consider in your, in your upcoming procurements as well. So I have, <clears throat> actually I have two questions. The first one is, is regarding the CPU, which yes. is the competition that we're expecting in HPC. Yes. So uh, covering the architect like power, ARM, and how much we're expecting to see a real competition in the future. So, mm -hmm. so far now with Intel, they are quite far, but in HPC, but we have what we're expecting to see until we see an exascale machine. And the second is back to the memory, where uh, the number of cores is growing. So we can see now 48 cores, and we're expecting to see more and more number of cores. We cannot, we cannot go up with, with, with frequency, so I'll keep adding more cores there. And the memory for HPC is fundamental. And the first thing we do is just we test the bandwidth of the memory and said, oh, this is HPC oriented or not by checking, checking, checking only the bandwidth on the memory. Mm -hmm. So we are facing, um, still with all this growing in memory, we are facing a problem is the amount of memory per core. And that's leading to a problem of the amount of memory. It's not following the number of cores is growing. And that's also an issue to the Exascape machine. So. Absolutely. So the, basically the question is, is we're, we're addressing the, the greater parallelism through number of cores basically because there's a failure of something called Dennard scaling laws and we can't just keep cranking up the clock rate. So the way manufacturers entice you to buy new hardware is they sell you more cores which will uh, supposedly give you better performance. Um, and will, in many cases, I don't mean to sound negative. So that's also where the Intel Xeon Phi product line came in as we move towards the exascale, what, what's, what Xeon, I view Xeon Phi as the moving experiment of Intel to address an exascale capable CPU system. So the question is, we know that power is, is the brick wall that we have to overcome. So we, we want to go to massive parallelism on a CPU basis, just like GPUs have, have gone that there without some of the limitations of the, of the GPU SIMD only memory. CPUs are MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple memory, which means they can solve any, any kind of general problem. So, so what, what's happening is that with Intel Xeon Phi, they're dialing down the capabilities of the cores to save power. Meanwhile, they're adding the vector units. Vector units are very power efficient. Um, sequential operation optimized CPU cores are very power inefficient. They burn a lot of power. And what's happening is they're getting, of course, a lot of pushback from users who don't want to have to adopt their legacy codes, 
which is where the <clears throat> all of the lessons learned in the Xeon Phi are migrating down into Skylake. That's why a lot of procurements are holding, waiting to get the Skylake performance, because that still has a very fast single core performance, but they're moving to more and more massive core parallelism, plus they're adding the vector, the power efficient vector parallelism, so that they can, so users can avoid the pain of just having to do a, a, um, an, an abrupt transition, but they can continue to grow. However, they're going to have to change at some point because uh, to scale to the ever greater number of cores, otherwise, you, you you don't have any need for a new system. I mean, the, the new hardware will run the, run your codes as fast or even slower and than the past. So we're going to see that the software um, industry, which is supposedly, you know, it's easy to change software, <clears throat> we're, we're actually going to have to start seeing that come to fruition. So I covered the first part, which is the, the movement towards mass parallelism. And uh, um, right now we're seeing the power series and the and the Skylake um, coming in, trying to keep that per core um, performance going. Now we get to the memory bandwidth, and we're seeing the advent of stacked memory, which is probably the biggest revolution in HPC that we're seeing right now, as the uh, capacity uh, and cost capacity increases, cost drops. Um, that's going to make our systems run ever faster. Basically, if you plug in a memory subsystem that is three times faster, I will bet a cappuccino that your uh, applications, uh, one per customer, <laughs> that your applications will run approximately three times faster. And that's playing out in, in practice. So that's why I, I really very much like um, uh, the balanced ratios uh, for procurements, because that's how you can easily identify, say when you do the flops per memory bandwidth, you can see that adding the more cores, that most of your users, if they keep their codes running at at a particular number for that for that balance ratio, they're only going to use a third or half of the of the new processing capability. And then in your procurement, you kind of make the bet of, well, they'll adapt and they'll and they'll start coming up and, and modify their codes to make use of the rest of that capability. But bottom line is, is it it all boils down to memory bandwidth and um, uh, and of course communications latency in the network. Uh, the reason why I stress latency as opposed to bandwidth is I'm not seeing that many MPI uh, programs, and yes, um, there are some, that are, that are network bandwidth limited. It's more the latency, especially as you get down to the smaller messages. So those are kind of the two key characteristics for, that I look at when, when I'm advising people is memory bandwidth relative to flops and network bandwidth, or excuse me, network latency relative to flops, uh, and then everything else kind of fits in, in secondary categories. Did I answer your two questions? Yes. Great. Hi. Um, just uh, because from the procurement from yesterday, we had, uh, so uh, as a HPC center, um, I think everybody is feeling a little bit the pressure in two directions, the vendors in one side and the, the users in the other about machine learning and deep learning. We need GPUs, we need GPUs, and, and you only can do that with GPUs. So um, the thing is, uh, from your presentation, it's like, well, yeah, not always. So how do you, or what is your advice a little bit, how we need to evolve? Because machine learning is here to stay. We have to deal with it. We mm -hmm. will have to provide these services, not only for the people only doing machine learning, that will be going spread out on all the d disciplines, so how we can uh, put a little bit of uh, common sense on this kind of heap and how we have to deal and move forward and in the next procurements take into account the people from mm -hmm. machine learning and be sure that we can serve them well. Well, it's you. Uh, well, first off, thank you, thank you, thank you for putting common sense into this because people fall in love with hardware and <laughs> with solutions and common sense. <laughs> um, it, 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 I, I'm just so happy to hear, th hear that coming in because uh, you have to bring reality into the situation. So how, how do we address this? Well, first off, machine learning is just one type of workload, okay? Uh, so training, which is what most people are going to be doing, is uh, very flop intensive, but it's very memory bandwidth constrained. So that's going to be probably my key dictating fact. Uh, the nice thing is, is that most of the packages that I mentioned, that 80% of the users use, run beautifully on GPUs and CPUs, okay? So that takes care of one of the big issues with GPUs, is can my software work on that, or are my will users willing to commit 
to investing the money in the procurement so that they can have those GPUs and that they'll use them. What I find happens a lot is people do experimentations with GPUs and then the, the, the hardware generally is underutilized um, uh, quite, quite, amount, quite a bit. So for the machine learning workload, the software is there and, and, and the GPU capability is there. So you can do the check marks on both of those. Then you need to see how much of the, that workload actually is relative to what my other user workloads are. And one of the reasons why many of the data centers are staying with CPUs and many procurements are staying with CPUs at the moment is they don't have the added complexity and configuration of the GPUs, but more importantly is they can run any workload. And they can run Python workloads, which uh, Python is, uh, is, an, is basically a very up and coming language it's a rapid application uh, language. But the reason why I say it's up and coming in the scientific community is we actually had Gordon Bell finalists who were running Python applications. And three years ago, if you would have said that, most people would have laughed you out of the room. Okay, so we're seeing rapid application development languages because people are recognizing that software development time is, is becoming a key fact in limiting scientific research. So they're investigating non-traditional C, C++ and Fortran approaches and getting very, very good performance. And so you have to look at how your workload mix is, is also progressing and, and where you want to take your users or give them the ability in, in the future. Of course, it's a com complicated problem. You, you gave a beautiful uh, talk yesterday covering all the different things that you have to kind of consider. And uh, my point is, is that just, just put it down into uh, a common language that everyone can talk. And I've found great success with balance ratios. And then after that, you go behind closed doors and have, have these heated debates or uh, long debates over, over uh, tapas and wine and come up with what is actually the real vision uh, for, for the data center. But you have to get everybody on the same page to do that. And I, I've had good luck with, with the balance ratios, but your mileage may vary. Hopefully I answered your question. So uh, that's all something related to the future and my question. And uh, uh, so far we have, we have two major problems on, on going towards 2020 or beyond, or to the XSK. One of them is power consuming and how we can build. So we can build a machine now with such size, but that's going to consume a huge amount of power and we're one of the biggest problems, so, and there are moving a lot, new hardware's coming out. The second is application itself. I mean, scale to, to a system like this. I mean, if, if you take MPI at the moment now to scale to existing machine, we have a question mark. Are we able to scale to the size of machine? That one I can answer right now is I know that um, I, I'm lucky being a media person that I can actually talk with, for example, the developers of the Intel MPI and other, other groups, uh, it's a Russian group. And their validation set is uh, 400,000 distinct nodes. And I think you can get to the exascale of 400,000 distinct nodes. So I'm not seeing necessarily, and that's what the RDMA landing zones and all those, you know, all the other caveats. So, so I am, I'm not seeing MPI itself being a scaling bottleneck. So I'll, I'll have, have a little slight disagreement with you on that part, but go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I took that as an example, but now when code to a real application, then we have a question mark. Then we have a big question mark, whatever. I mean, take any of the scientific application, physics, astrophysics. That's a different question than, yeah. than I understood. And that, that relies on the, on the application group. Uh, so the way I like to phrase it is sometimes the rate of change in the scientific community is at the rate of a career and not by other um, methods. So people, use, people have been doing some of these codes for decades, and they're used to doing it. And if a machine won't support it, uh, they won't buy it just because they, it, it, they have to change. And... Uh, <laughs> How we can push that to change, or to co-design the application to be able to fit inside the machine? That's where the key point. How we can push the sensors, research sensors, to be able to redesign their code to that to might be done. Because now we have the problem that it moves first. I mean, oh, I don't have the machine, so I yes. cannot change my, my code. And, you know, and we have a problem that when the machine is arriving, it's just going to be too late. To Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the game, who's going to blink first? And <laughs> yes, so 
Um, so actually, amazingly, I think I have a good answer for you. Um, I have my own view, but um, NERSC is uh, tasked with doing this for a very large user base in the scientific community. So I would look at what they're doing. I, I alluded to the, the roofline model initially. Uh, that's, that's a good thing uh, for helping optimization. But NERSC has to address this because they, they have an Intel Xeon Phi based system. And there's, there's basically three things that you have to get across to your users. The first is that, um, <clears throat> as, as they said, uh, the NERSC guys actually said it really well, is this is the first big system that has been procured where the performance per, uh, core, if you do nothing, your performance is going to drop, probably uh, by, by 60%. Okay, so the first point is you have to educate their users that that's going to happen. And secondly is that's unavoidable because we're just at the stage now in the technology that we can't keep going with Dennard's scaling law. So, so the world has changed, okay? So that's the first point is they have to come to the realization, just like someone who's been drinking, that they have a problem, okay? The second is then that there's a fix for the problem. And they just have to start bringing in and uh, couch it in a way that they like. Like they have to bring in a lot more new postdocs, new innovative thinking to start revising the code. That's a good thing. New postdocs, new innovation tend, tends, to, tends to be good and you get funding for people that way too as well. Um, so that you can start revisiting these, uh, these older codes or um, more stale codes that are new but they're fairly stale, static, uh, to address the scaling issues. That's one reason why, uh, and this is not a plug for OpenACC, but um, OpenACC is a lock-free algorithm, uh, lock-free programming paradigm. So you can't, you don't have a critical region. And locks are horrible for scaling. And that's why, just like with the GPU abstraction with the thread block, and I hope I conveyed the, the, what I think is a beautiful solution, it's simple and clear, is OpenACC leverages that as well because you take away blocks but then they have to start thinking in terms of how to make use of all of this parallelism in, in the right way, and, and you can do that. Um, and the nice thing is once, once you do it, it translates back to the OpenMP programs, the traditional parallel programs, and you get the benefit of that. So many people who do, do an OpenACC port actually speed up their, their legacy OpenMP codes as well. And you can have the pragmas for both, um, both language approaches sitting in the same codes, C, C++, Fortran. So, there's also an education. The whole point of that kind of answer is you have to teach people how to program in a scalable fashion because many of these codes were developed when two or four core parallelism was a lot. And you just don't see any of the scaling issues that you have now with 400 cores. And why there was a lot of objection initially to CUDA where you have to scale out to <coughs> hundreds to thousands of concurrent cores. And one of the first things you have to do is, is throw away locks. Just like in the uh, uh, file systems, people are looking at throwing away the POSIX semantics and, and doing a new, newer version of that. So I, I do think um, I would contact NERSC and say, how are you guys approaching this? We would, like, we would like your feedback on how you're educating your users so that we can adapt this. Because they put a lot of thought and a lot of money into this. And they, they have the problems that you're talking about, which are monumental for you. They have it at, uh, at scale, and, and so they're, they're addressing it. So I do think that's a good answer to help you with, is direct you, direct you to the nurse guys. Thank you so much. Um, we have now the, well, I would like to thank you again, speaker. Thank you.